So good afternoon. Welcome to today's Tempo Talks webinar. I'm Jen Dirks, President and CEO of Temple Milwaukee. Welcome to all of our Temple Milwaukee members, our emerging women leaders, and our many guests um, with us today for this important discussion around the disproportionate impacts of COVID-19. We have some incredible panelists that will lead today's discussion. So thank you all for being here today. For those of you new to um, a Tempo Talks or having attended this for the first time, a few housekeeping items. All of our attendees have been muted. Uh, we have disabled the video for our attendees as well, but that does not mean that we don't want to hear from you. We do want to hear from you. So throughout this session, we encourage you to use the chat function or the Q&A function located for me at the bottom of my screen to ask any questions of the panelists or to share important resources or information uh, with uh, today's attendees. So thank you. Um, you can advance it. So uh, again, for our Tempo Talks, for those of you who um, are attending our Tempo Talks for the first time, these started right around when our new normal and we were adjusting to life as we knew it, know it with COVID-19. And so we started this, uh, these webinar series uh, to provide information, education, inform and educate our members around everything uh, related to COVID. So we have really customized these conversations to include the expertise of a variety of different industries with our Tempo expertise. So we've been really fortunate to do that. We started weekly we have now switched to every other week during the summer and this will be become a part of our programming moving forward because our tempo talks have been so well received by our members and guests that we want to continue this for the um longevity of tempo milwaukee this would not be sponsor, uh, uh, possible without the sponsorship of Beano harris bank who we are so pleased to have sponsored our entire tempo talks series so with that, I'm going to start with the introductions of each of our panelists today. We have a quite an um, incredible group lined up for you. So I'm going to begin with Nancy Hernandez. Nancy Hernandez is the president of the Hispanic Collaborative, an initiative involving more than 150 stakeholders seeking to improve economic opportunities, representation among Latinos, and moving Milwaukee to a top 10 ranking in the Hispanic Wellbeing Index. Nancy is also the president and founder of Abrazo Marketing, a leading integrated marketing firm dedicated to connecting companies and organizations with diverse audiences. Nancy serves on the boards of the Society Insurance, Marquette University, United Way of Greater Milwaukee and Waukesha County, and is the founding member and past president of HPGM, Hispanic Professionals of Greater Milwaukee. Nancy is also a longtime member of Temple Milwaukee, having served as past president from 2008 to 2009, and last year received the Temple Mentor Award. So Nancy, at this time, I'm gonna ask you to um, unmute yourself and your video so we can see you. Great. Um, next. Derek Mosley, Judge Derek Mosley graduated from Marquette University Law School in 1995. A lot of Marquette love today, that's awesome. After uh, graduation, he served as an assistant district attorney for Milwaukee County from 1995 to 2002. In 2002, Derek was appointed municipal count court judge in Milwaukee. At the time of his appointment, he was the youngest African-American to be appointed judge in the state of Wisconsin. In August 2004, Judge Derek Mosley was appointed Chief Judge of the Milwaukee Municipal Court. Judge Mosley sits on the board of directors of several organizations, including the Urban Ecology Center, the YMCA of Metropolitan Milwaukee, Safe and Sound, and Trans Center for Youth. I know this won't come as a surprise to our audience, but Judge Mosley is not a Temple member, but has been an incredible advocate for Temple Milwaukee over the past several years, most notably attending our signature events and serving as a judge for last year's Tempo's Got Talent. So judge, welcome. Um, Jenny Stebenick has served as CEO of Progressive Community Health Centers, a federally qualified health center with four locations on Milwaukee's north side since 2005. Previously, she was director of mission integration at a large health system and was executive director of Agape Community Center in Milwaukee. Jenny serves on the board of the Wisconsin Primary Healthcare Association and is the board chair for Freighter Hospital. 
Jenny has been a Temple Milwaukee member since 2010. Welcome, Jenny. Awesome. And Anna Simpson. Anna Simpson serves as Director of Community and Economic Development at WIDA, um, better known as Wisconsin Housing Economic Development Authority. Anna leads a statewide team that focuses on growing economic development statewide, as well as promoting financing products and tools that support WIDA's multifamily lending activity. Anna currently serves on the advisory board of La Casa de Esperanza in Waukesha and is board secretary of family services. Anna joined Temple Milwaukee in 2017 and is currently co-chairing the membership committee, participating on the DNI committee, and is involved in a mentor circle and has an EWL mentee. Whew, that's a lot. Thank you, Anna. Welcome to all of our Esteemed, esteemed panelists, it's so lovely to have all of you here. So before we dive into the, the content, uh, we like to, and we've started to develop this trend when we uh, started our Tempo Talks with really diving into a little bit more of your personalities and um, what is really motivates you. And so I'd like to start with Nancy. So Nancy, I'm going to have you unmute yourself and share with us what is your personal, it could be a professional mantra, what has been getting you through COVID or life in general? Uh, thanks, Jen. Thanks so much. Uh, I'm very happy to be here with the rest of the group. So um, one of my favorite quotes is by Ben Franklin, and it goes something like this, um, the best way to begin about work is to work. And so that's something that resonates with me that I've used, and I think certainly during COVID-19 where um, we have had to deal with curveballs that the world hasn't seen before uh, and the complexity of those issues. It has served me well during this time frame. Absolutely. I love that. And we'll try and capture all of these mantras because I think there are so many great nuggets that we get from that in our, in our chat. So um, Derek, I'm going to go to you, Judge Mosley. What is your mantra? So uh, the mantra that I live by, and, and basically it's guided me through a number of uh, things that I've uh, gone through in my life is to never let the highs get too high and never let the lows get too low. That has guided me through everything, whether it's COVID, whether it's uh, kidney transplant, whether it's just things going on every day in life. Never let the highs get too high or the lows get too low. I love that. And we will definitely um, hear more about that and how you've really um, used that, uh, that mantra during, during this COVID time. So thank you, Judge Mosley. Jenny, what about you? What is your mantra? Well, the mantra that is motivating me these days is um, every system is perfectly designed to get the results it gets. And I happen to be reading uh, this book um, throughout this upstream. It's a new book. And, and uh, I took that out of that book, though I don't think it originated in there. And um, it has really resonated with me throughout this and it has um, kept me motivated. That's to improve awesome, Jenny. <laughs> yes, that's perfect. Wonderful. And I also want to point out that Jenny is on a vacation this week and has, um, we are so delighted that you are participating with us. Um, so thank you for Happy to be here. being with us today. Anna, what about you, your personal or your professional mantra? So for me, it's count your blessings. Um, I focus on the fact that I have my health, my family has their health, and I'm actually enjoying this. Um, for me, I feel that I'm blessed that I have the ability to work from home since all of this has started. And I've been with my children for four months straight. Um, as a professional woman and a working mom, I've never spent this much time with my kids. And of course, there are moments where I want to pull my hair out because my seven-year-old is trying to ask me a question or is video bombing me, as Jen, you know, because you've seen him. <laughs> um, but just like that, he'll turn around and give me a hug or give me a kiss. And it puts it all into perspective about how blessed I really am. I love that, Anna. Thank you so much. Um, I think so many on our call today can really relate to that. So thank you for sharing that. Thank you everyone for sharing your mantra. So let's begin and dive into really the, the meat and the content and why our attendees are here today. So the title of this is the disproportionate impacts of COVID-19. And as the CDC states, longstanding systemic health and social inequities have put some members of racial and ethnic minority groups 
at increased risk of getting COVID-19. As of June 12, 2020, this is the latest, age-adjusted hospitalization rates are highest among non-Hispanic American Indian or Alaska Native and non-Hispanic Black persons, followed by Hispanic or Latino persons. So those are the national statistics. And I, you know, I think part of our discussion is how those compare to what's happening, happening in our own Wisconsin backyard, and more importantly, why this is the case. So I'd like to begin today's discussion with Jenny and Nancy to talk about what they're seeing and showcase kind of these local, local statistics. So Nancy, let's begin with you because I know we've got a couple of slides that we're gonna have you walk through and talk about what we're seeing, what these um, statistics mean to you, and then we'll move to Jenny as well. Perfect, thanks so much, Jen. Um, so, you know, I, I think one of the important things to think about before we start talking about the impact of COVID-19 on black and brown communities is what did we have going in? And so I prepped just two quick slides to show us, you know, what, what is the situation that we have going into COVID-19 and how does that relate to, as Jenny talked about, you know, systems are designed to give you the output that they're designed to give, and that's really what we need to look at. And so this snapshot that you're seeing on the screen right now is a snapshot of the Hispanic community, and I'll just go over some quick highlights, right? But, you know, certainly um, if we compare it to the black bar, which is a median county on all of these, the gray bars are higher in all the wrong places and lower in all the wrong places. And the size of the disparity on some of these certainly affects what we're seeing. So a $10,000 household differential and median household income impacts our households and it really creates a driver from an economic perspective uh, during this time frame in a way that we don't want to see because families are facing tough decisions. And a 1.1 from a Hispanic standpoint, average household size bigger, talks about the issues of um, isolation or quarantining within a household and what's happening there. It also magnifies the economic issue that you face when you have less money and more people. So those are some of the snapshots of what we see. The other piece that I think is important to note is if we look at the uh, pie chart, we have 80% of the Hispanic workforce is concentrated in four industries. And those four industries happen to be very related to the issues of COVID-19 and are some of the hardest hit. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a snapshot of the African-American community and we can see the same issues there, right? Low, the lower bars and higher bars and all the wrong places. So here we have a higher black poverty rate adding to that economic burden into those households. Here we have a disparity of almost $20,000 in median household income. Um, and if we look at, uh, sorry, don't have the same pretty pie chart, but the over-index industries from a workforce perspective, you see similar issues. You know, healthcare support is highlighted or bolded there for a reason because um, our African-American community, that's an area from a workforce perspective that they really over-index in, in those healthcare support pieces. So some of the things that we're seeing both on an economic side as well as an essential worker category lead to our outcomes. Next slide. So um, the Hispanic Collaborative has been mapping these um, rates of infection in community, in black and brown communities since, uh, since April 1st. And this is updated through yesterday. So we have roughly 4,500 Hispanic cases and 3,800 black cases just in Milwaukee County. You know, I want to, uh, the, the two parts that are circled for you um, are, are spikes that were very, very fast rates of growth. So in the Hispanic community, during that time frame where it crossed over um, and overtook the African-American rate, we were seeing rates of about 150 cases a day in Milwaukee County, just in the Hispanic community. Unfortunately, what we're also seeing right now is an increase in African-American cases on the tail end of this spike. This is a, represents close to a doubling 
from what we've previously seen, and right now we're seeing cases at about, at least for the last eight days or so, about 60 more cases a day in the African American community. Um, the right side just shows you how stark those, uh, the issues are from um, a percentage of population. So um, Hispanic, you know, we're 6% and 4% respectively, but 30 and 34% of the cases. African American, 6 and 26% and 17 and uh, almost, uh, or 29% in Milwaukee. So that kind of, that shows you numerically and graphically what that means for our community. Next slide. If we think about impact, we have to talk about the financial impact in our communities. Again, because of those essential worker categories, we have very high numbers from a household perspective of financial impact. So in Hispanic households, over 60% of households, I've seen the number as low as 61 and as high as 70, are facing a loss and or reduction in income. So 60% um, plus of the households in the Hispanic side, and in the African American side, that's 45%. If we think about immigration status within households, there's up to 20% of Hispanic households just in our region that have no access to stimulus dollars. So think about uh, three to four months with zero income and no access to expanded unemployment or unemployment or any of these other pieces. On the business side, um, I think the things that we want to think about there are 70% of our African American businesses right now are closed or experiencing temporary or limited service and 50% of our Hispanic businesses are. If we think about them tapping into um, some of the stimulus dollars, 40% of African American businesses haven't, um, didn't apply because they do not believe they're, or excuse me, they don't believe that they would be approved and about the same in the Hispanic community, thinking that they weren't eligible for it. So our businesses um, that believe they would only be able to survive six months or less of this, and we're two thirds of the way into that now, 40% of our African-American owned businesses and 50% of our Latino businesses feel that. Next slide, please. This is the last slide, I promise. Um, but I think if we think about what this means, what this picture paints and the impact and focus of it, you know, one of the things that I think we want to note is the last recession, the great recession that we just went through, widened the disparities in our black and brown communities. And the numbers that you see on screen, a widening of home ownership disparities in both black and brown communities, education and median household income, those are local Milwaukee County numbers. So that's the impact that the last great recession had in widening those. And what we're really trying to do is mitigate up to a 10% home ownership loss and mitigate a 50% failure rate in businesses in our black and brown community. And what are our opportunities to invest, to leapfrog in some of the initiatives that we're trying to do and certainly and diversifying those workforce because when we look at something like COVID-19, that has really exacerbated the impact both financially and health-wise in our black and brown communities. Nancy, Nancy, thank you so much. I mean, um, certainly uh, discouraging, um, you know, statistics to share. And so I, I want to come back to specifically what the Hispanic Collaborative is doing um, and, you know, what Temple members and our Emerging Women Leaders and those attending can do. But I also want to bring in Jenny um, because, Jenny, you know, as we talked before this, uh, we started broadcasting this, you know, the, uh, you live and breathe these numbers and you see these stats daily. And so I want to maybe talk a little bit about from your perspective with Progressive Community Health Centers what you're seeing, maybe first talk a little bit about your organization and its impact and, and on the community and your mission. 
Sure, thank you so much, Jen, and thank you, Nancy, for that great overview with the statistics. Uh, well, Progressive Community Health Centers, uh, we are a, a federally qualified health center on the north side of Milwaukee. Um, we provide medical, dental, behavioral health, radiology, social work, case management, health education services to about 16,000 people per year. And 85% um, of our patients are African American. We have four locations. Our main location is on 35th and Lisbon, but we have an urgent care next to the emergency department at Sinai. That was very intentional. Uh, so the people had a different choice um, rather than the emergency department for primary care purposes. And then we have two other family practices, one at Sinai and one at the Hillside Family Resource Center and the Hillside Development. Um, and so we purposely go into the neighborhoods where there is the most need. That's what community health centers do. Um, we're one of five community health centers in the city of Milwaukee, and so we are located in the areas where um, there is more need, and, and uh, we purposely put ourselves right in people's neighborhoods. We are for the community, by the community. 51% of our board members have to be patients of the clinic, and so we really are um, about community in the community health center name. So that's what Progressive um, does. And we saw very early on uh, that um, COVID-19 was really on fire in the African-American community. And this was, remember, um, when it first started, there were very strict guidelines uh, in terms of testing. We didn't have tests available. Um, and even if there were some tests available at some health systems, you had to have a fever and dry cough and shortness of breath and um, you had to have traveled somewhere in order to get a test. And so meanwhile, it is spreading rapidly. There wasn't the contact tracing that there is now. Um, even the mask guidance was very confused at the time. We didn't have masks anyways. You know, we, we were conserving masks in healthcare organizations and cloth masks weren't a thing. So, you know, you have to think back just a few months and that's when things rapidly spread throughout, um, throughout communities like the African American community, especially. Uh, like Nancy alluded to, we, um, the African American community that we serve, very often there are inter intergenerational households um, or more people living in a household with maybe one bathroom, it's very difficult to isolate. Um, it, we didn't have the hotels at the time, and even now, the, they're not located in the neighborhoods where our people are. Transportation is an issue. So all of these, you know, they're, they're essential workers. Um, all of these really created the conditions for rapid spread throughout the, um, the community. On top of that, you know, the African American community and the Hispanic community um, already experience great health disparities and um, and lack of access to health care. And the health disparities that we see, you know, I, I do like to go upstream, you know, when we're talking about, well, what caused this? What, what brought on these health disparities? And all roads lead back to systemic racism. And, and whether it's education, employment, housing, um, the built environment that people find themselves in, even racism or um, uh, the bias in healthcare that is experienced by these communities. And so, um, you know, this has created just another perfect storm of another health disparity. And, you know, we when we talk about systems and statistics, we have to remember that there are human beings behind those numbers, behind the systems, and we, you know, it, we are called to really take care of um, our humans, our, our fellow human beings, and, um, and really look at the systems that have created uh, what we find ourselves in right now. Yeah, thank you so much for that, Jenny. I'd like to actually bring up that last slide um, that Nancy talked about, because uh, that's really the why, which is what you just mentioned, Jenny and Nancy. And, you know, you talk about home ownership, you talk about education. I know um, Anna will bring her on a little bit to specifically talk about the home ownership. And um, you look at the household income. So I'd like maybe for the two of you to kind of address uh, Nancy, from the Hispanic Collaborative perspective, what you all are doing um, to address these inequalities, 
and uh, Jenny as well from uh, your organization. So Nancy. Uh, thanks, Jen. So, you know, I'd say that the Hispanic Collaborative, um, our long-term goals are relevant today as ever. However, in the short term, we really looked at this 12 to 18 month time frame and readjusted our work to understand what can we be doing today to ensure that Hispanics can uh, recover at the same pace as everybody else, if not better, to be able to shorten up these disparities, not widen them. So that's what we've really been doing. Um, our efforts are on two fronts. One is there is some severe bleeding going on in community. When we start thinking about the makeup of these households, the workforce they're in, we don't have an end in sight yet. And to expect that um, these households can survive with, you know, the average is about $1,500 in savings um, in our black and brown communities. Um, that was gone the first month, right? So what, can, what are we doing to help invest in that? I will say for those um, on the call, United Way and Milwaukee Responds, both have invested in dollars that are actually going to families in need with limited or no access to other stimulus resources um, in the neighborhood of, you know, 100 to 400 per family, and they've distributed about 110,000 in there, but that only scratches the tip of the iceberg. So continued advocacy for dollars and investment into that. I mean, think about, you know, uh, you hear some of these stories coming through of folks whose lives have been touched by this investment. And, you know, imagine a parent um, not just concerned where their next meal is coming from, and that's really where these funds are, are assisting in that space. But having to explain to a child why there isn't a meal coming up on the horizon for the next day. And so that's really important that that's an area that I want to continue to highlight. The other is, as we, we the other thing that we've been able to do is look at a recovery plan that um, will guide our work to ensure that we can have that recovery piece, right? And I would say, there are two things that I'm hoping that this group could take away. One is without an intentional strategy that hopefully our black and brown communities and organizations are leading and with the resources to do so, it, it will take intentional strategy and resources to ensure that we don't further widen our disparities in this, right? So how can we be intentional about that? invest in that and there's advocacy that can be done by this group to ensure that some of these recovery dollars that are coming out are not distributed in an omnibus fashion. We know what that gets us. That gets us widening out disparities. Um, the other piece is how can we stay close to um, the digital issues if we look at digital access, digital equipment, digital literacy has really is across the board impacted the ability for not just businesses, but households and individuals to stay safe, to stay competitive, right? Um, and to have a livelihood coming in. So all three of those, I would suggest that people understand what's happening there. Where can they invest in pieces like Milwaukee Responds or Tech Equity? from United Way, um, City Forward Collective is also doing a lot of work through the schools in that area. There is a lot of need. Um, the, the solution of a long-term um, internet access for households and families is a long range solution, but we have a short range problem. What are we going to do in this next year? And so get close to it, get informed and advocate and invest where you can. Yeah, I so appreciate that. So I'm just going to, um, you talked about the investment um, and you listed off City Forward Collective, United Way, a bunch of them. We're going to try and capture them in our chat as well. You talked about an intentional strategy and then you talked about this digital literacy. So thank you all three um, incredible key points. Um, Jenny, as well as your, um, you know, how you are addressing these disparities with um, your organization as well. 
Right. Um, first of all, I can expand on what Nancy said about advocacy. Um, that is something that everyone can do. And I, I talked about systemic racism and that can feel like world hunger, like, well, what can I do, you know, to address systemic racism, first of all, vote, but also um, just advocacy to your representatives. And that, you know, that goes into education and employment and all, you know, criminal justice system, all of these systems that have been set up to um, advantage some people and disadvantage other people. And uh, so there's a lot to be said to the advocacy piece. Um, also, the, the health disparities really are what we um, address the most, uh, but we, we do hire from within the community that we serve. And so we look at our workforce and how we can advance our workforce um, and, and bring their um, income up. You know, our minimum wage is $15 uh, an hour. And, um, and how can we encourage people to um, continue their education, continue their career advancement, and really see healthcare as a career that can support their family. Uh, and, and we do that, you know, we want to do more of that within the community as well. That's another thing that others can do. Look at your industry. Um, how diverse is your industry? And can you have interns? Or um, can you have a mentorship program? And um, when, you, when you look at opportunities, where are you recruiting from? And so those are things that, that we, um, that I know can increase the household incomes and the opportunities for um, diverse people in our community. Certainly the, the health disparities though, one of the things that I, I will mention is that um, uh, we haven't talked much about the mass incarceration problem that we have in Milwaukee and Wisconsin in general. And, um, and I, we look at the people who are coming home from mass incarceration, for, from incarceration, and that they are suffering from chronic conditions at a higher rate, um, sometimes addiction issues as well, mental health issues. And so we are working with Advocate Aurora to create a program that will utilize community health workers to connect people to care um, as they are re-entering the community. And these community health workers will have lived experience. Um, so this is an opportunity for people who have previously been incarcerated, but they need employment opportunities as well. And so often they're just overlooked, you know, or they don't even bother applying in some cases if there's a box you have to check of, you know, uh, that indicates a criminal background. And, um, and I think that that has created a ripple effect throughout our community that has um, continued poverty and other disparities, uh, as well as health disparities in the community. And so we need to really address that. Thank you, Jenny. Um, all incredibly valid points. I mean, I, you talked about the importance of the advocacy piece and having that diverse pipeline as well. So thank you, ladies. Um, we'll bring you back um, as well, but um, thank you for all of that. We've got some questions coming in. I encourage folks to continue to um, offer resources or questions that you might have for the panelists. And we'll bring Jenny and Nancy back in just a moment. But now I would like to bring in Judge Derek Mosley. So hi, how are you doing, Judge? I'm well. I'm Good. Well. So I'm gonna um, I'm going to remind you of a date, March 27th, 2020, a day that changed your life forever. Talk Definitely. a little bit about what happened on that day. Sure. So uh, that was the official date that I received um, notice that I had tested positive for COVID-19. Prior to that date, I um, had been experiencing a cough. I also had problems breathing. So like right now, and I do this all the time, and people think I'm crazy when, I'm, uh, when they're around me, but I always take deep breaths because um, what happened, how I noticed something was wrong is each day my breaths became more and more labored. It was a lot more difficult to take a deep breath to the point where when I got my test back and um, I alert, my doctor called me, and said, you need to go to the emergency room right away. I was only breathing um, like that, just to keep going. Because any, any harder than that hurt my lungs and I couldn't get any more breath in. So when I got to the emergency room, 
Um, immediately, I got in the room. Uh, and what's so interesting about the, this process is um, I just got called to get to the emergency room. So I just took off to the emergency room. I didn't worry about what I was wearing. I just took off to the emergency room, got dropped off by my family. And then that's it. They can't come in. I was completely alone at that point. So I get into the emergency room. I sit down and my blood oxygen level is extremely low. So they put me on oxygen. Um, then it went to one, then to two, then to three. And my level still wasn't going up to the point where I reached the highest level you can get on oxygen. And so from that moment, from the ER, I got immediately transferred to the COVID ICU. So once I got transported to the COVID ICU, the one thing that actually stood out to me as I was heading there was that everybody in these rooms looked like me. Um, and as I'm, I'm going through the ICU in the bed, as they're transporting me, each room I go by, I keep looking and everybody in those rooms are black like I am. And so um, that initially had an effect on me. I get inside the room and the rooms are interesting because they're sort of like hermetically sealed. So it's a process for them to come in and out. Uh, nurses get fully garbed up before they come in and out. So there's no in and out. Um, there's nobody with you, so you're completely alone, and I still can't breathe. I can't get enough air to, to come into my system. Um, they laid me on my uh, stomach because they figured on your stomach, you it opens your air passages. And so that's the way I was laying the whole time I was there. I was in the ICU for eight days, um, still not able to get any oxygen in. And I remember the doctor came in, and actually I shouldn't say came in because the doctor never actually came in. The doctor would call me on the phone. So at that moment, I knew it was serious. If the doctor's not coming into the room, something's seriously wrong. So I pick up the phone and, and he basically um, put the fear of God in me and said that uh, you're at this point where if your oxygen doesn't get any better, we're going to have to ventilate you. Um, and of course, being a lawyer, I'm sitting in my room googling ventilation and realizing that people who were being ventilated had a 85 or 86 percent death rate and so i freaked out um because i didn't want to be ventilated and the ventilator's outside the room and so it's there so um but for the fact that um i had a nurse who came in and you know you're completely alone it's the room's dark and you're sitting there and all you have is your thoughts. And so you think about your mortality and I thought about my family and I thought about everything. Um, and fortunately I had a, 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 some, I had great nurses. Um, and one nurse came in, sat down, brought an iPad. So I was able to talk to my family. Uh, I hadn't seen them since I had been admitted. Um, I of course not realizing what I look like. I have everything hooked up to me, things in my nose that as soon as the video popped up and I came up, my oldest daughter just completely lost it because she had, she saw me leave the house and I was dead, right? And then she sees me on this video and I am completely hooked up to wires and it, it was just awful. But we talked, we got to laugh and honestly, I got to say my last goodbyes um, because I wasn't quite sure based on what the doctor said I was going to um, not be able to just not to be able to talk because once you're ventilated, you you aren't able to talk, um, but be able to survive. Um, fortunately, that experience uh, gave me the fortitude to continue on. And I woke up the next morning, uh, my blood oxygen started to get better and I wasn't, uh, I didn't have to be ventilated. Um, what was weird for my experience though, Jen, is that um, I had known while I was in the hospital, which is so crazy because you're in the hospital, you have this TV, you turn on the TV, all that's on the TV is who died from COVID. And I'm sitting there thinking, oh my God, I'm going to be this next person. And then I turn it on and I see that rep state representative David Bowen is tested positive. Mm -hmm. And then a few minutes later, I see that um, candidate running for city attorney and now city attorney, Chairman Spencer, who's African-American, both are African-American, test positive. And I'm learning more and more from my Facebook and social media while I'm laying there that I, I know a lot of people have tested positive. But what's so interesting is that everybody who I talked to, all my colleagues and friends who are white, I was the only person they knew who had tested positive. And I was like, wow, I know like six or seven. And, and so that's when it hit me that this is something that's having an adverse effect on my community. 
Um, I wanted to piggyback on something that Jenny uh, said in regards to um, systemic racism, especially within the system, because that's something I'm very familiar with. Um, the reason why it, one of the reasons why it has such an adverse effect is um, in jobs and employment is because as a system, the criminal justice system makes it very difficult for people. A lot of people aren't aware of the fact that if you get convicted of a criminal charge for marrow, possession of marijuana um, or any drug offense, but specifically possession of marijuana is why I wanted to, to bring that to attention because 26 states, it's completely legal. Wisconsin is one it, which it isn't. And so what happens is once you get convicted of a possession of marijuana, you lose all federal student loan money. You are automatically ineligible. So now we have made it difficult for people um, who have that conviction to even afford to go to school because we know the price of education is so expensive. Also, that conviction can also bar you from public housing. So now we have not only prevented you from a place to live, we prevented you also from a place um, to get an education. So no education, no place to live. And not to mention, Jenny mentioned the box and there's a movement to ban the box and the box being when you have to check that you've been convicted of an offense and you're convicted of that offense and now you're not able to get a job. So we've limited your job, we've limited your education and now we've limited your housing for an offense that in 26 other states is completely legal. So um, I just wanted to piggyback on that. No, yeah, definitely appreciate that. And I so appreciate your perspective um, and so many important things that you've touched on. I think the biggest question for me and for maybe those is how are you feeling now? How is your health? Yeah, I feel amazing. Um, I, uh, like I said, every day I do that breath test and I had the lung capacity tester. I know everybody's familiar with it. It's the machine that you put the nozzle in your mouth and you take a deep breath and a little blue ball goes up and down. When I was in the hospital, I couldn't get that blue ball off the bottom of that tester. Um, and that's how hard it was for me to breathe. And I can't stress to people how when you're breathing like this, you know there's a problem. That, that's not right, that that's the amount of oxygen coming into your system. And it's, it is absolutely terrifying. We take breathing for granted and oxygen for granted, but once you don't have it, it becomes crucial. Yeah, I mean, you chronicled your story. I am honored um, to be among one of your friends on Facebook and to read about um, you and to hear your, your story. It was um, heart wrenching. And, you know, even to this day, there are those that maybe are out there that don't think it as, as serious. What is your message to those that maybe aren't thinking it's as serious as it is? Well, mask up is the first thing I'm gonna say. Please mask up. Here's the way I look at it. I see everybody on social media talking about, well, there's not enough proof that masks work. All right, so forget about that part, right? It's a minor inconvenience. When you are hooked up to a machine that allows you to breathe, believe me, that's a lot more of an inconvenience than a mask. And the whole thing is the mask, if it doesn't work, who cares? You've worn a mask, who cares? But just think if it does work, you are saving lives. Um, I, I speak for everybody on the front lines, the nurses, the techs, even the people who come in, because people forget about the staff who mostly are African-American, who came in to clean up my room every day and were touching all the things that I, they threw in the garbage that were on me and around me. They need you to wear the mask because once those, uh, health systems are at capacity, then we are truly in trouble. So it's a minor inconvenience. Mask up. Um, the last thing I'll say on that is the people who are in the ICU when I was there, there were a number of people who passed away while I was in the ICU. And the one thing that kept going through my mind is that every one of them died alone. Not anybody they knew in that room with them. Everyone died alone. So uh, nobody wants to die alone. No. Just mask up. That's all I ask. Thank you, Judge. Mask up. Um, it could not be more um, 
thoughtful coming from you. So I so appreciate you sharing your story. We'll bring you back. I do want to um, welcome in Anna Simpson at this point from WIDA. Um, so I know um, uh, Anna, Jenny and, and Nancy talked a lot about the why and really focused on the homelessness and the crisis there. So we're gonna bring up a couple of slides and I'm gonna have you walk through um, these slides, Anna, and share your perspective from WIDA and behind this homelessness why. So um, why don't you unmute yourself and uh, we'll, we'll move forward. Thanks, Jenny. Um, Jen. So before I jump in, I want the audience to think about um, what does housing mean to you? Um, it means a safe neighborhood, good schools, access to fresh food, even a grocery store, and equity. So ask yourself, have you ever used your equity? And if so, why? If you had to, could you? And what would that mean for your family? Keep these answers in mind when I go over the qualitative data. Um, because of my role at WIDA, my focus is to highlight the disparities in housing, go beyond what neighborhood we live in, and how unforeseen circumstances like COVID can have a detrimental effect on families. Also, how disparities in policies, cultural barriers, and generational knowledge can shape your future. I'll share more on um, Milwaukee's perspective on redlining um, and a little bit of the history there and the effect on communities, particularly generational impact on the African-American community. But for now, I want to share cultural barriers by sharing the story of a Latino family. So in 1948, my grandmother, left Puerto Rico for New York City to get settled. By 1950, she had my dad, who was 10 years old at the time, and his brother at age 14 travel with their 18-year-old cousin to meet her in New York. She had been gone for two years without her kids. When my dad was 19 years old, he moved into the Thomas Jefferson projects in East Harlem. These projects in New York City were occupied by primarily Puerto Ricans, Dominicans, and African Americans. Ironically, the other day, my elementary school friend was visiting her mom and sent me a picture from her old bedroom into my old kitchen. Back then we would all hang out the window and group chat. My husband was shocked that her mom still lived in the projects, to which I explained that if we would not have moved to Wisconsin, my dad would still live in 12 seat. So we moved here in 88, and at the time my parents were 48 and 57 respective, respectively. They had zero credit in their name. This is not uncommon with migrant or immigrant communities. My mom immigrated here to the United States at 35 from Spain. The only reason my parents were able to buy a home is because the owner of my dad's factory stepped up and helped him through the process, going so far as to vouch for this couple that had zero credit. So shout out to First, uh, First Star Bank and loose lending rules of the past. Um, over the weekend, as I was preparing for this, I had my 19 year old check her credit and her score is 750. Fiscal responsibility is a learned behavior that has generational impact. So now I'll shift gears to WIDA. So the Wisconsin Housing and Economic Development Authority works to expand affordable housing and economic opportunity throughout Wisconsin. We were established in 1972 by state legislature, and in 1983, um, this legislature included financing for the expansion of business and agricultural activity throughout the state. We issue tax exempt and taxable bonds to help finance affordable housing throughout the state, including 9% federal taxes, tax um, credits, and 4% tax credits. Throughout the years, WIDA has financed more than 75,000 affordable rental units, helped more than 133,000 families purchase a home, and provided more than 29,000 small business and agricultural loan guarantees. Last year alone, we lent 500 million in single family loans, which put over 4,000 people in homes throughout the state of Wisconsin. It's important to note that WIDA is a self-supporting public corporation that receives no tax dollars for its operations. Before we talk about the disparities in home ownership and the intersectionality between secure housing and COVID, I wanna share a little story on how we got here. Um, I'm sure most participants have heard the term redlining. I want to walk you through how redlining has impacted Milwaukee for generations. A century ago, Milwaukee had a thriving African-American community. 
Milwaukee had one of the highest amounts per capita of black owned businesses throughout the country. By 1938, cities were asked to create maps that marked areas as red or as a hazardous risk for home loans and for insurance. Documents that accompanied these maps included verbiage like Negro or slum area, laborers or lower type Jews. Keep in mind, Golda Meir grew up in one of these areas. In Milwaukee, there were 19 areas that were shaded red. These redlining maps were used in cities across the US showing blatant racism. But worse, if you lived in these areas, you could no longer get a loan from a bank to buy a home. The Federal Fair Housing Act outlawed this discrimination by 1968, but by that time, the damage had already been done. Multiple generations of specific demographics were denied the ability to obtain one of the greatest appreciating assets. Meanwhile, white counterparts were passing on generational wealth, attending better schools, and now living in suburbs that were thriving and not blighted. If you fast forward to today, another advantage of purchasing a home versus renting is affordability. It's more affordable to own an entry-level home in Milwaukee, Racine, and Kenosha compared to renting. So the bad news is, is that we've been dealing with this and these disparities since the 1940s. And unfortunately, as Nancy showed before, the trends are going in the wrong direction. The good news is that COVID has brought to the mainstream these disparities that we've been dealing with for generations. Um, in 2019, the Wisconsin Realtors Association set out to create a report that showed the lack of affordable housing throughout Wisconsin. Their unintend unintentional result was uncovering the declining numbers of home ownership amongst millennials and also African-American and Latino households. Next slide. Unfortunately, Wisconsin does not rank well against other states when you look at housing disparities. In fact, home ownership in people of color is dismal in comparison to our white counterparts. In 2007, since 2007, we have seen a faster decline in home ownership rates in African-American and Latino Wisconsinites. But we have entire cities in Wisconsin that you should keep in mind are food deserts. They're not towns, they're not unincorporated townships, but cities. This is in addition to entire neighborhoods in the city of Milwaukee that are food deserts. In fact, the entire city of Racine is considered a food desert. We also have a problem with aging stock throughout the entire state. We have a need to build a pipeline of emerging developers and developers of color so that we can continue to diversify who is building homes in the state. Next slide. WIDA is embarking on research that aims to find testable solutions to some of our housing disparities. Part of our success in these efforts will involve partnerships. If you are a leader in housing, healthcare, food, education, or philanthropy, reach out. We need to think about these issues as community-wide issues and understand that all of these factors are determinants of health. What role can you play? As a community of leaders and people of influence, we can play a crucial role in the relationships, collaboration, and leverage that is needed to move the needle. We also need to consider the important role that home ownership plays in the well being of families and broader community. If you're an employer, have you considered down payment assistance as an employee benefit? Are you providing staff with lunch and learns focused on financial education? Many banks will bring financial education in-house to employers for free. Provide a path for folks that may not have the means or see a path for themselves. Next slide. I often use the analogy of a wheel. Spokes are affected by bearings that are misaligned in the middle of any wheel. We are all affected when our urban centers struggle. Change takes public and private partnerships. Use your influence, Use your privilege, use your power. To the participants who are community leaders, employers, HR professionals, change policies. Be intentional in your hiring practices and internship programs. Be intentional on who you mentor and sponsor. Employer benefits. Down payment assistance for a first time home buyer is a benefit that can have generational impact. Provide employees with free financial education. Remember, lunch and learns are free. Next slide. In closing, 
Housing fits into the puzzle of COVID-19 because it brings to the surface the issues we have as a community of insecure housing. Many people live paycheck to paycheck when there's a sudden disruption in family income and a delay in receiving unemployment benefits. Families have to choose um, between food and shelter. Populations that are affected most are communities of color. People of color are heavily represented amongst jobs classified as essential workers and frontline workers. Both Derek, Jenny, and Nancy all covered this. Again, keep in mind what I said about certain areas and communities that are food desert. Um, limited access to fresh food, healthcare, living in multi-generational homes, all of this has impact. Um, the first link on this last slide is a nice tool that if you wanna learn more, this goes neighborhood by neighborhood in Milwaukee and shows demographics and underlying health conditions by each neighborhood. Um, so in closing, what is WIDA doing? Regarding homeowners, whether it's a WIDA mortgage or a mortgage with another lender, we are stressing that borrowers communicate with their lender if they're unable to make a mortgage payment or foresee an upcoming issue. Communication is key and there's tools on our website. Also, we are working with the National Council of State Housing Agencies to advocate for federal stimulus appropriations, as well as actions by housing regulatory agencies to support homeowners during this difficult time. Specifically, we are asking FHFA, Fannie Mae, Fannie Mae Freddie Mac, rollback program changes that have increased costs and reduced loan eligibility for first time and low to moderate income buyers. In addition, we're seeking additional funds for homeless and rental assistance, as well as flexibility from Fannie Mae and Ginny Mae um, for late fee amnesty and mortgages originated under these programs. For renters, again, our website has several resources for all types of renters, including details about $25, millions, $25 million in the Wisconsin Rental Assistance Program available through the Federal CARES Act. This program is designed to assist renters who have lost income due to COVID-19 and is administered by the Department of Administration or DOA. So in addition, WIDA has outreach staff throughout the state that participates in various local and regional groups to address all housing concerns and ensure that we're connected to the issues of the state. Thank you, Anna. Thank you so much. Um, so in the essence of time, I'm asked that all of our panelists come back. This was such great information, Anna, that you shared. I wanted to remind everyone that we have recorded this session. So if there are resources or links that we um, have not provided, please, please be sure to go back and um, listen to the recorded version of that. I would like to um, thank all of our panelists. Um, and before we wrap, I just want to give each of you an opportunity to share your perspective on what you believe the most important thing our audience should know about the disproportionate impacts of COVID-19. What is that one key takeaway that you really want to make sure our audience is aware of? Jenny, I'm going to start with you. Sure, thank you. Um, the most important thing to me is that people understand that this isn't about individuals and individual responsibility. It's not just about that. I think individuals are being blamed um, and, and we really need to look at systems and, and especially the systemic racism that has led us to where we are today. Um, and, and in addition, I just wanna also um, say we really need to use this experience as an opportunity to create better systems and a better response for, you know, the next time we have a, uh, an emergency, you know, we need to have a more organized response to take care of people who are not always able to take care of themselves. Appreciate that, Jenny. Thank you so much. Judge Mosley, the important key takeaway that our audience can um, come from this, uh, this conversation. I always go back to it. Mask up Milwaukee, please. I don't leave the house without a mask. First of all, I don't leave the house often, but when I do leave the house, I always wear a mask. My family wears masks. Please wear masks. It's, it's a small inconvenience to help out a large number of people. Thank you so much. Thank you for sharing your story. We are so happy to hear that you are safe and healthy. So thank you, Judge Mosley. Thank you. Nancy, important key takeaway. Thank you. Um, so I'm an action-oriented individual, 
And I'd say, you know, to me, the biggest takeaway is this is an unprecedented situation that really has exacerbated existing issues. It's put our worst foot forward. But how can we inform ourselves on what the key issues are and how we can help? Don't sit on the sidelines and it will require intentionality. Go with what your passion is and, um, you know, advocate, invest, and see what you can do. Get involved, get engaged, um, agree. Thank you so much, Nancy. And Anna, final comments on, um, you know, the key takeaway from today's discussion. For me, the key takeaway um, is that we all play a role in changing what's happened in the past. And I'll stress what I said about even the role that employers can play. Think about financial education as a benefit that you can offer your employees that has generational impact. And $3,000, let's just say, for a down payment for a first time home buyer, again, can have multi generational impact. If we want to break that cycle, it has to start somewhere. And I think that it does take a community, but employers can play a very crucial role that I don't think they've thought about prior. And I think that that really can make an impact in our community. Great. Thank you, Anna. Um, changing the narrative for our community and so many great ways to do that. Um, thank you to all of our participants or uh, our panelists. I apologize that we did not get to any of the questions, um, but there was such great dialogue. So I didn't want to stop the momentum of um, what we were hearing. So um, this conversation was wonderful. I hope um, you all enjoyed it as well. I encourage you to tune in to our Tempo Talk sessions. Our next one is in two weeks, um, and we invite you over the noon hour to join us again. Again, thank you to all our panelists. We're running a couple of minutes late, um, but uh, hopefully you will enjoy your uh, weekend, and thank you again for participating today. Thank you. Thank, thank you, everyone. everyone.